Welcome to the World Chess Hall of Fame. We're a museum in St. Louis that aims to make chess fun and accessible for all. Uh, my name is Emily Allred, and I'm a curator at the World Chess Hall of Fame, which means that I get to help develop and put together all of our shows here. Today, you're going to get a tour of Keith Haring Radiant Gambit, an exhibition which will be on view at the World Chess Hall of Fame through May of 2021. The exhibition covers the life and career of Keith Haring, an artist who was very famous during the 1980s. He was born in Reading, Pennsylvania in 1958, and he grew up in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. He learned how to create artwork from his father, and the two of them made comics together that were inspired by the work of Dr. Seuss, Walt Disney, and Charles Schultz, the creator of Peanuts. When Haring was in high school, he decided he wanted to be an artist, and he moved to New York in 1978. When he arrived there, he met a lot of other artists and musicians, and he was really inspired by their work. He also was inspired by the city of New York and the break dancing, graffiti, music, and imagery that he saw around him. Keith believed that art was for everyone and that it should be part of everyday life. One of the first series of works that he created was called Subway Drawings and we're lucky enough to have two of them in the show. He would go to the subway and he noticed that whenever there were advertisements in the subway tunnels or subway stations, that when the advertisements came down, they put up a big black piece of paper and he saw it as a canvas that he could fill with his artwork. He would create an outline around it, somewhat like you would see in a comic strip with the different panels and he create an image within it trying to tell stories either within multiple panels or a single one. In the one that we have on view in the show, there are two people who are bound together by a rope, and it looks like they're struggling together to kind of free themselves from each other. Um, artwork like this can be seen as ephemeral, or it really means that you know it's not meant to last forever, but sometimes people would really love the work that they saw when they were on the subway, and they would tear it down and take it home with them to keep as a souvenir. In all, he created over 5,000 of these, and they became part of almost the landscape of New York during the time that he lived there. He had a good friend named Sin Quan Chi, and since these works didn't often last for a very long time, he would travel around the city to document them, and he photographed Keith along with him making the work, but also the works on their own. We're lucky enough to have one of his photos in the show, and he shows Keith Haring in the pop shop. And the pop shop was a store that Keith Haring opened um, in the 1980s, and he sold artwork there that anyone could afford. Some of them were prints, some things were t-shirts, buttons, and we even have an inflatable baby in the show that he created for sale there. Herring believed that art was for everybody and he wanted it to be something that was accessible to anyone at any price. We can learn a lot from Keith Herring's artwork. He used very simple shapes and figures to tell complex stories. He created outlines to create shapes and different figures. And even though they might look simple at first, a lot of times he has um, very deep meanings within his work. Other ones are just fun. He often depicted people in action, and he showed that by surrounding them with lines show, kind of vibrating with activity. One of the pieces that we have in the show is called Untitled, and in it he uses a figure from Greek mythology to tell his own story. And you can see it behind me, actually. He used a figure named Medusa, who was a woman with snakes for hair, and a gaze that could turn people into stone. But he made it his own. Instead of having snakes for hair, he did a figure with tendrils coming out of its neck and little figures struggling at the ends of, of uh, each of the tendrils. Um, they, some of them maybe look like they're kind of waving and maybe having fun. Others seem like they're struggling to get free. He also used images from the Bible, um, like Jesus on a cross. And in one picture that we have in the show, he used um, barking dogs around the cross. Other 
pieces in the show show some of the symbols that he would use in a many of his artworks. One of them, these series is called Icons. And so it shows very simple images that he would put in different contexts, oftentimes in the context of a panel where he would be showing a story. And so there are some that became very familiar to people in the 80s, like the radiant baby, a crawling baby with different rays coming out of it, a symbol of goodness and purity that he used as a signature in many of his pieces. Others are angels and demons and a smiling face with three eyes. There are also barking dogs. And we see these symbols transformed in the chess sets that we have on view in the show. Each, we have two chess sets in the show and they're from our permanent collection. And that means that we have them forever and we can exhibit them in different shows. Here we have the different herring chess sets that have some of his most familiar symbols. People with a heart, barking dogs, the three-eyed face that we saw in the prints, but they're all chess pieces. And so whenever you play a game, you kind of advance them across the board and almost create your own work of art and composition, which is one of the things that's really beautiful about the game of chess. Keith Haring created artwork on a number of different subjects. Some were very serious, like racism, homophobia, and the AIDS crisis, but he also created lighthearted celebrations of life and also um, pieces that were aimed specifically for kids. He often worked with kids to create projects, but also created projects for them. He worked at children's hospitals, youth centers, and even created a mural for a public swimming pool. We have one really special series by him in the show called The Story of Red and Blue. And in it, there are these bright blobs of color with black line work over them, creating fun and lighthearted illustrations. They almost resemble a book by Dr. Seuss. In this story, red and blue are kept in different separate panels and, and prints until they embrace before the final one where they turn into purple. This was one of Herring's later works. Um, he unfortunately passed away at a young age, but as you can see in this exhibition, he left behind so much work that we can all enjoy. In this part of the tour, we're going to explore the work of different artists who were inspired by his legacy. So in this show, we have the work of four street artists and four St. Louis artists, and they're all looking at chess, as well as the life and legacy of Keith Haring. So two of the artists are UK-based street artists. One is named Darren John, and the other is Sick Boy. Sick Boy is especially um, inspired by the work of Keith Haring, and he really enjoys um, looking at chess sets as a means of creating a work of art. To him, the chessboard is a canvas, and as a game is played, it creates different compositions. If you look at his board, it has some different comic-inspired il illustrations that kind of take similar inspiration to the work that Keith Haring did. We also have two chess sets in the show that are by artists who knew Keith Haring when he was alive. One of them is LA2, and he's a street artist from New York City. He met Keith Haring when he was in junior high school. He was a graffiti artist, and Haring had seen his work around the city, and he really wanted to meet him because he admired his work. When he was doing some volunteer work at a high school, or junior high, um, some students introduced him to LA2, and the two of them started to collaborate. They would paint on all kinds of surfaces, from tarps to um, clothing. We have a photograph of the, some of the clothing that they created together in the show, and then even sculpture. For this exhibition, LA2 created a chess set in homage to his friend and fellow collaborator, Keith Haring. He uses bright colors and covers them with tags. Um, you can also see really active line work, which you also see in Herring's artwork. The two of them inspired each other as they collaborated, 
and Herring's artwork became even more active after he met L.A. too. We also have a piece in the show by Terry Noir, who was the first artist to paint on the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall was a wall in a city called Berlin, Germany, which separated the city into two halves, so people couldn't see each other if they lived on the two different sides. Terry wanted to bring attention to the wall, so he was the first artist to paint on it. He and his friend would have to sneak there at night, and he created a very simple illustrative style so that he could quickly create artwork and then get away. <laughs> um, he used very simple, bright colors and to create these images of faces with different expressions, and you can see them on the chess pieces that we have on view. He met Keith Haring when Haring traveled to Berlin to also paint on the Berlin Wall. And the two of them became friends. So we're very lucky to have two pieces by artists who knew Haring in the show. In Keith Haring, Radiant Gambit, we have artwork by four St. Louis artists who are all inspired by Haring and chess. The first of these is Pete Eyes Wolliger. And his artwork can be found throughout St. Louis, adorning buildings and walls throughout the city. He believes the eyes are the windows to the soul, so he includes them in a lot of his work. And here you can see it in the background, as well as on each of the chess pieces on this colorful board. He transformed the normal chess pieces that we see into pieces that express his individual style, with eyeballs on top, kings and queens and bishops. Um, Pete really believes strongly in the value of community and he creates artwork all around the city just like Herring did in New York. Um, Pete also met or saw um, Herring's artwork when he was a young man and he traveled to New York as a high schooler. He really admired it and he wanted and he was inspired by it throughout his career. He also helped to preserve one of Keith Haring's artworks from being destroyed. So they have a very strong connection. Another St. Louis artist that we have in the exhibition is Stan Chisholm. And he creates this beautiful mural that's inspired by Haring's bold visual style. He created two kind of views of these elaborate chess pieces. They look almost like they could alternatively have a lot of decoration that's gaudy or intimidating, or like they're two warriors who've been to battle and come back with their armor beat up, but still alive. <laughs> um, we also have a work by an artist named Dale Chambers, and she's interested in um, history, and you can see that in her work. Her mural is called In the Shadow of the Queen's Throne. So enveloped in the robe of the stately queen are different figures representing the many um, and the sense of community and history. She's also inspired by the history of the game of chess, which is connected to that of an ancient game called Sinet in Egypt. Sinet started out as a game that people played for fun, but it also gained a religious significance over time. Here, she pictures ancestors almost like pawns on a chessboard within the protection of the chess piece queen, who's the most powerful piece on the board. And if you look carefully, you can see other allusions to American and Egyptian histories. The final St. Louis artist that we have in the exhibition is Ido Rosenblith. And he created a beautiful work on a tarp that depicts Herring's kind of ethos that art should be for everyone. Keith Herring believed that art should be for everyone and he did a lot to kind of make it accessible. Sometimes he painted art in public places like in parks, in public um, areas, different youth centers and children's hospitals. Other times he made it accessible to people by allowing it to be sold for a cheap price. He loved his fans and he would often get in trouble with his art dealer because he would make drawings for people for free. And they would say, you need to you know, be selling your work, not giving it away. But he always enjoyed making his fans happy. Here, Ido takes that saying, art is for everybody, and turns it into an enormous mural shaped like a chessboard. On each of the white and black pieces, 
he has a, or squares, he has a piece of that saying. And he also has a diverse group of characters, some grotesque, some funny, kind of showing that art is for everyone, just like we say that chess is for everyone. And I hope that you enjoyed this tour of our exhibition here at the World Chess Hall of Fame.